Well, good evening and welcome. My name is Dr. Rahul Deshmukh, and I'm honored to be able to speak to you this evening and thrilled that you can join us for the third installment of our Th Southeast Orthopedic Specialist Community Outreach. We are strong partners in the Jacksonville community and wanted to be able to provide these webinars to all of you in the community to hopefully learn a little bit more about how to stay safe, how to stay healthy during this pandemic and, and onward, and hopefully upwards as the months go on. So, This evening, I'm going to be speaking to you about how to save your shoulders and knees and also talk about some advancements in treating common sports medicine injuries. This is a passion of mine and an area in which I've been focused my focusing my practice since 2004. And just as a reminder, for those of you new to webinars or not being in the Zoom culture, if you would, please enlarge your screen fill your screen with this particular uh, web page, and then we'll be able to work out the best viewing opportunity for you. The, this slide is, in some of my partner's terms, the I love me slide. For me, this is really more I love my parents slide. They're the ones, I hope they're watching tonight, because they're the ones that deserve all the credit for giving me the opportunities to be able to succeed and, and take on these challenges. I grew up here in Jacksonville and I was surrounded by medicine. They taught me what it means to be a doctor, what it means to care for patients and treat them like family. And I'm also a proud graduate of the Bowles School here in Jacksonville, graduated and then went on to Duke University for my engineering degree and Harvard Medical School for my medical degree. I stayed on in Boston for 11 long cold winters and I did residency there and three fellowships in trauma, sports medicine, and joint replacement. Not just because I wanted to stay in school forever, but really because I wanted to make sure that I could be an expert in nearly anything that a patient presented with, to be able to provide the proper solution and the right answer for each patient and every time. I've been thrilled to be back here in Jacksonville, treating you all, my Jacksonville community, since 2004. I am a founding member of Southeast Orthopedic Specialists, and despite having very little, maybe a little bit more gray hair than I'd like to admit, I'm the most senior member of our practice. With that, I've seen thousands of patients and worked earnestly to make sure I treat every patient with dignity and respect, treat them like family, provide thorough conservative care, rebuild shoulders with the latest in sports medicine uh, or knees with the latest in sports medicine techniques, and if necessary, proceed to joint replacement with the most advanced technology. So with that, I'd like to launch into how to avoid seeing me in the first place, how to be able to stay safe, stay healthy, and stay away from doctors. So my goals for today are to talk about what to do and what to avoid in terms of physical exercise and your daily living. We no longer have the benefit of going to gyms and being able to see personal trainers as often. In case something does come up, you may wanna see an orthopedic surgeon. What should you expect? And if it involves actual treatment, and further procedures down the road, what are some options and considerations you should think about? So starting off, one of the many, many things that I love about orthopedics is that it's based upon anatomy. I'm not gonna go into the weeds of what I learned in the first year of medical school, but I do want you to understand some of the basics of the most mobile joint in the body, and that's the shoulder. On your screen, you'll see on the left side, you can see some ribs, see the collarbone on the top, and you'll see a long bone running down the side. That's called the humerus. At the very top of that is the ball in the ball and socket joint of your shoulder. It's covered by what looks like a tissue paper-like structure. That's the joint capsule. Helps to hold that ball and socket in place. If you look at that small inset to the side, you're gonna see an oval. That's your socket in your shoulder joint. And around that oval is a ring of tissue called the labrum. That's a bumper, kind of like on the edge of a pool table, helps to hold that ball in place. And if it tears, it can lead to instability with that ball coming in and out of socket. Well, one of the other parts that helps to hold the shoulder in place and provide better function and stability is the rotator cuff. And in your screen on the right side, all those muscles, four main muscles in fact, are what make up the rotator cuff. Helps to rotate the arm 
but you may notice if you can bring that arm out to the side, you'll see it could rub or pinch on the very edge of the shoulder blade bone called the acromion, and that can lead to something called impingement. We'll get into all those terms in just a bit here. How about the knee? Very complex joint as well, but more like a hinge. It bends and straightens. Now, some of the terms you may have heard of, meniscus tear, particularly as football season opens up, even ACL tear. If you look at the screen on the right, those two red discs, slightly different shape, but serve the same function. They're cushions, shock absorbers in the knee. And they're really important to protect so that as you take every step or run and every stride in sport, you're gonna have proper cushioning and shock absorption to make sure that you don't end up in pain or damage that smooth gliding cartilage. That's the white part you see on the end of a chicken bone. That white part is really important for protective movement and pain-free function of your knee joint. Other important things to consider in the knee in terms of the anatomy are that round bone over on the left of your screen in the very center, that's your kneecap. If you put your hand on the front of your knee, you're gonna feel that, that's your patella. And that helps to glide back and forth and can be involved in different injuries that we'll talk to in a minute, talk about in a minute. In addition, the rope-like structures on either side are the ligaments, the inner or medial collateral ligament and the outer or lateral collateral ligament. And then in the right part of your image, in the very center, those two rope-like structures are in the front, the ACL, and in the back, the PCL. The ACL is commonly torn in a lot of sports injuries. And just so you're familiar with some of these terms, I wanted to bring up those two anatomy images so you can understand what we may be discussing this evening. So again, how do you stay away from someone like me and stay home and stay safe and stay active and away from doctors? Keys to prevention, maintain a healthy diet. That more than anything is what's gonna translate into healthy weight and then avoiding injury down the road. It's important as well to work on exercise. People suggest about 150 minutes a week of strength training and cardiovascular exercise. That can seem like a lot. And in today's day and age, we always wonder, what's the very least I have to do to get by? So studies have actually been done and it shows that if you do 15 minutes, that's it, 15 minutes a day of strength training and cardiovascular exercise, you will get a whopping three years of extra life at the end of it. So that's a great return on investment. If you can just invest 15 minutes a day, that amount alone will lead to an increase in longevity of three years. That's a really good return on investment. Other things you, you should focus on are flexibility and regular stretching. It's important to make sure you keep your joints loose so that all those smooth gliding surfaces don't start to get too much pressure and end up having damage occur. So what are some things to consider? We talked about diet being so important. Well, in general, whole food diets are really critical. There's been a lot of discussion about the importance of avoiding processed foods. Studies actually looked at getting the same calories, the same nutrients, the same protein amounts through either a whole food diet, whether you know vegetables, meats, et cetera, or in processed foods. Those who did it in a whole food diet, in general, got the same calories, the same protein, but lost weight. All the food processing takes out some of the important ingredients that we really need if we get the original whole foods. Well, what happens if in your diet, you may not be able to get all those ingredients every day? Well, it's important to consider some supplements. Particular now, as we're worried about our immune system, it's important to consider supplements like vitamin A, especially vitamin C, making sure your vitamin D levels are high, and then important ones for energy, B6 and B12 are critical, and for bone health in particular, necessary for what we're talking about today, making sure your vitamin D levels, dietary calcium are in really good shape. That's gonna be important for bone health, cartilage safety and cartilage uh, protection. In addition, taking appropriate amounts of omega-3 fatty acids, you can get those in those fish oil capsules, uh, or even turmeric, which is a spice. If you get it along with the curcumin, and I'm getting a little bit detailed here, but that combination has been shown to really provide substantial improvements in inflammation. There's a lot of things you can read about an anti-inflammatory diet. Taking turmeric with curcumin can really reduce inflammation in your body, almost as well as some of the over-the-counter 
Advil, Aleve, or Motrin, those kind of medications. And it doesn't have the same side effects, still protects your heart uh, and avoids blood pressure issues. So the key is diet to prevent cartilage damage, improve your bone and ligament strength. Also, to be able to keep a low fat diet is critical. There's a lot of benefit towards increasing the number of plant or vegetables, fruits, and things that we eat more than just animal fats. That's gonna be critical to keep a healthy weight and avoid additional stresses on your joints. What about exercise? You know, if you don't have a personal trainer yelling at you to drop and do 20, you wanna know how to start, how to be safe, and where to progress. So you wanna always begin with a warm up. You should do gentle stretching a little bit before, but in particular, focus your stretching for after your exercise routine. You're gonna get a lot better return in the stretch and your muscles will elongate better after you've already done your workout. You also wanna start slowly. Don't jump right into CrossFit if you've never worked out before or P90X video just because it's easy to download. Make sure you do something that's very gradual and then work your way up, even walking. If it's hard to walk a block, start halfway. If it's hard to walk 30 minutes, start 10 minutes. Add a few minutes each day. As long as you're slowly progressing, you're gonna see major changes over the course of a week, course of a month, and so on. You're gonna see real improvements if you just stay committed. Also wanna focus on non-impact exercise. That is the safest for that smooth gliding cartilage we talked about on your, the end of your knees or other parts of your body. And it's important to consider things like walking, a basic exercise, but great return on investment, swimming if you have access to a pool, cycling and elliptical machines, even if you have arthritis. A lot of good data out there to show that even with arthritis, you can get tremendous improvement in overall well-being, flexibility, and bone density. It's important to avoid osteoporosis or weakened bones. And so these exercises that are weight-bearing but non-impact are very important. Other thing that's critical is you may, you know, buy the latest Amazon gadget or get a new Peloton bike is to know how to use the equipment. Make sure you're doing things correctly with proper form and you don't ever do an exercise in a technique that causes pain. Never play through the pain, never push past pain. That's critical because you will hurt yourself, especially if you do it repetitively. The other thing I wanna mention on here is making sure you have good shoes. It's really important to try and get as much cushioning in your shoes so that any impact from walking, running or otherwise gets absorbed in the shoe before it gets put into the rest of your body or in your joints. So make sure you get good shoes and change them as needed. Other things to consider, what type of exercise should you in include in your routine? Well, it's important to think about cross training. And what that means is actually adding a variety. Variety is the spice of life and it's also what's best for your body. You wanna include a combination of aerobic conditioning so that's getting the heart pumping, strength and endurance training, building your muscles, and then by continuing to add on different exercises, overall build muscle mass. That's very important. And then as we discussed, flexibility is critical. So that, com that really forms the basis of how you need to fill your exercise routine. That key 150 minutes per week should be a combination of these three. Now, it really is also important depending upon what age range you're in. If you're young, those are key years to really build the bone density and the muscle mass that your body will depend upon for the rest of your life. So it's important to focus on strength first and foremost. And you also don't wanna ignore cardio exercise and flexibility, particularly stretching after both your strength workouts as well as your endurance or cardio workouts. And then as you get into middle age, you know, a lot of things will still be important to focus on, but you may notice new aches and pains and you wanna work on a balance, everything in moderation. So strength along with cardio and flexibility and relatively equal amounts. Again, never push through the pain, making sure you're doing a healthy dose of each of those in combination. As we get older, we always certainly worry about heart disease, lung disease, you know, making sure we avoid diabetes, so cardiovascular exercise takes a really important part of our daily routine, whether a walking program or some of the more active versions of that. But you should focus on flexibility to keep your joints supple, 
Make sure you don't end up with too much tightness, aches and pains, and you don't want to neglect strength. As you get into your later decades, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s and up, you also want to continue to work on building strength to be able to avoid, unfortunately, the, the gradual loss in muscle mass that occurs as we age. So that's the right combination and the right mix and blend. One other thing to touch on, high intensity interval training. It's a really common phrase that's thrown out there, but to be clear, it doesn't mean you've got to sign up for some really crazy exercise routine. It can be done as simply as in your walking program. What it means is that you combine episodes of really brisk exercise followed by slow or moderate paced exercise. So with walking, for example, you might do 45 seconds of a really brisk walk, just churning, walking as quickly as you really can. And then you slow down for maybe 15 seconds or 30 seconds of a comfortable pace. You'll be surprised as you do that combination, you know, quick spurts of on again and then backing down, you're going to increase your endurance, increase your stamina, and you wake up cells in your body that are really important for longevity. High intensity interval training has been shown to improve longevity in a lot of different studies. I want to keep my Jacksonville community young, healthy, and active and living a lot of years. So I want you to all to think about that in your exercise routines. Other things to consider, preventative measures, exercise. What are you really working on? How are you gonna do this safely at home? Well, I would encourage you, as you're gonna see in these videos on the side, use simple exercises to start. Weight-bearing exercises, it'll improve bone health, avoid osteoporosis, you wanna improve muscle strength and joint stability. Choose an amount that is starts off light. We wanna focus on low resistance, high repetition exercise. So be able to do at least 12 repetitions, three sets of any given exercise. You don't wanna be struggling to lift, you know, five reps of a weight and then hurt yourself. I had the fortune or misfortune of having my own wife have that problem. She was working out with a trainer who pushed her to really do some reps and she came home, couldn't lift her arm. You know, I guess I was on call that night as her husband and I had to help her nurse through a shoulder injury and thankfully she's better, no surgery, and she's doing great. So it's important though, start slowly, low resistance, higher repetition, don't kill yourself and make sure that you're doing it safely. Resistance bands are really good for shoulder exercises as you saw in that video on the left. And on the right, what was gone over were important exercises that build strength in your quad muscles and allow you to improve strength and flexibility. And in particular, that last movement where the gentleman was lifting the leg with the toes pointed out to the side is a really good way to improve strength in your quads, keep your knee crap, your kneecap tracking correctly and not cause increased pain. So it's important as well, when you're doing any kind of exercise or muscle training, allow time for proper recovery and rest. If you're really used to going to the gym, you wouldn't do the same workout seven days a week. Same with any exercise program you're doing at home or under your own supervision. Make sure you vary it, change it up, and give yourself a good 24 hours break in between. That's when the muscles will break down, and then the next time you're back at it, the muscles will come back stronger and be much better for you. What about exercise don'ts? I see this a lot in my practice as I'm talking patients through injury and getting them to the side of recovery. Will they say, what do I need to avoid in the future? Well, these are really important, particularly when you either have pain or you're at risk for injury. If you've either already had a shoulder injury or knee injury, or you may be otherwise, you know, just deconditioned, not really knowing what you should be doing, these are the things to avoid. And, you know, it's written out there in front of you, but in general, as we talked about with that shoulder anatomy, overhead lifting brings your arms into that position of impingement where that ball and those tendons of the muscle can pinch on the shoulder blade. If you do that with force, you're gonna increase the squeezing between the tendon and the bones. Same with overhead pulling and pushing can also be a problem. I see that in carpenters, overhead you know, laborers, people can really hurt themselves just on the job. Any repetitive motion overhead is gonna be a problem. And then the other thing that people don't realize or appreciate, particularly if you have really bad back pain or knee pain, and you think that's my biggest problem, you need to be careful about using your arms to push yourself up 
to be able to get up out of a chair or get up with a bad back, you're gonna hurt your shoulders. Similarly, if you've already got some shoulder pain, doing push-ups or planks or dips can also actually irritate your shoulders, even though it might seem like a relatively low impact exercise. How about for knees? Well, I often get people say, you know, my knee's fine, but it kills me when I do a squat or a lunge. Well, as you might guess, I'll tell them, well, maybe you should stop doing squats and lunges because that's going to cause significant problems in that circular bone in the front of your knee, that patella that we talked about earlier in the anatomy slide, that grinds with five times the weight that you're pushing. So if you think that you're doing your body a favor by doing a leg extension or a leg press, you know, with 100 pounds or 200 pounds, all of that weight, nearly 1,000 pounds, is going across that very small bone in the front of your knee. Now, if you have no pain and that's really what you're into, great, go for it but it does put you at risk. And if you have pain, it's definitely gonna set you back. So be careful and avoid these activities if you are having pain in either of those joints. I mentioned kneeling and cycling because if you've got knee pain, that repetitive bending and straightening is gonna be a concern and cause irritation and even some tendonitis and other issues. So those are the things to avoid. Now, how about certain exercises that you should incorporate no matter what your age? Balance is key. So it's important to develop muscles in your core, your lower body, and really at any age, exercise such as yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi is very beneficial. It can prevent falls, improve your independence, and really avoid injury overall. Other things to consider, particularly as we're all, you know, in this Zoom society, everyone's at screens, they're sitting down. Wait, you're actually probably sitting down right now looking at a screen. We're gonna try this. One thing you may not know, all 814 of you that signed up for this talk, this is a two-way video. So I can watch you. I wanna see audience participation, everyone with their arms up, leaning back, trying to get a good stretch, really get that arm all the way overhead. You're already feeling a release. Those shoulder blades are moving and gliding back. Your posture is, is better, and you're gonna be able to breathe much easier. So this is important, not only for your shoulders, but your neck, and for your breathing and posture. Other things to consider, really open up in the back. Get that neck and back stretched all the way back. That's very important. Your power pose is gonna help in a lot of different ways and squeeze those shoulder blades together. And that's a nice way to really improve your posture as well. Avoid strain at the neck and at the shoulders. Finally, stretching both the back and the neck, a good rotation and twist in your seat and just sit and hold it. You know, maybe turn off your video when you're doing your Zoom chat or Zoom call and get a nice stretch going. Even consider setting a reminder for yourself if you're stuck on the screen doing online education or other things where it's just hours on end of looking at videos like this, set a reminder so that every 15 minutes you're gonna stop and take a break like this. Stand up and stretch as well. It's important to constantly be moving your body so you don't get fatigued and get stuck in a rut. Now, what happens if you've done all these things you've gone through the preventative measures, you're working on a healthy diet, you're trying to do safe exercise, but you still have problems. What if you have a problem playing tennis or getting back to the sports that you love? If you feel locking or popping or catching in your shoulders or your knees, a deformity, you may have a sudden change in the way your shoulder might look or your knee, or there's some pain or even a, a knee that's loose or unstable. Well, that's when you, wanna make, you may wanna call someone like me. And I promise even if I'm wearing a mask, I'll be smiling when I see you and be more than happy and honored to help you. So what to expect? My goal, as I discussed before, I'm gonna treat every patient like family. This is a calling for me. I've got the best job in the world. We're gonna go through a very thorough history, physical exam, and start off conservative. X-rays like you see on the right. What you'll notice in that image, on the very right side of your screen is a ball, and then on the left is a socket. And in between on that image, there should be space between those two, but instead it's down to bone on bone. That's a helpful image telling me why that patient might have stiffness and difficulty moving their arm. We're gonna start off with conservative treatment. I'm a big fan of ice. A lot of the things that we do lead to inflammation and irritation. And if you put heat on it, it may make the muscles feel good, but it will add fuel to the fire. So in general, first line of treatment should be an ice pack or cold therapy. We'll also discuss the option of anti-inflammatories, taking either the oral tablets, the, the pills, 
of Advil, Motrin, Aleve, the ones that are commonly available over the counter. Or if things are really bad, we might consider a prescription version of those. There's also topical or gel type of agents that you can massage or work into achy muscles and tissues that can really help a lot and avoid a lot of the side effects that we might other side, otherwise see with some tablets. Physical therapy, exercise is key. And as you saw from my earlier slides, it's something I believe really strongly about is a way to prevent injury and improve injuries once they happen. So we're gonna go through a physical therapy program, have you work through exercises with a skilled and trained expert in physical therapy, and then also transition to a home exercise program. I often give patients handouts that go over those two videos of the shoulder and the knee exercises as really safe places to start until we can get you going to physical therapy. Other things we may consider are injections. And I put plus minus there because in general, injections sometimes can be very helpful if you've got severe inflammation, but they can also be harmful. They can lead to, as we've learned recently, problems with cartilage breakdown and even accelerate arthritis. So I use caution and use my best judgment in whether or not to take that approach with you. We may consider referral to imaging such as an MRI if we need to understand how the soft tissues have been damaged and what else may be going on with your joint. Now, in terms of the shoulder, there's a whole range of possibilities. You know, there's acute injuries. If you suddenly fall and you have a fracture, you know, I just last week I had a patient come in. He said, you know, doctor, I fell and I broke my arm in seven places. And I said, well, maybe you shouldn't go back to those seven places. Sorry, that's a dad joke for my kids. And I hope they're watching tonight. That's for them. So other issues. If you fall, you could break your arm as we talked about. You could even get a dislocation where that ball comes out of the socket. And that's an important thing to be able to watch for and evaluate. We'll talk a little bit about the ways to distinguish types of dislocation. You could fall and tear some of those important tendons, rotator cuff or biceps. You could have though chronic issues where repetitive lifting over time, you're going through your military press or overhead lifting, or maybe you're a painter or just doing overhead yard work. You could lead to impingement I've seen a lot of patients come in, they're you know, doing those loppers or shears, trying to trim their hedges, and they lead to a sudden rotator cuff tear. Other chronic issues are related to arthritis, and that's something that we'll discuss in a bit as well. So what, are, what about instability? People say, well, my shoulder feels like it's shifting around. Is that a bad thing? Well, it depends upon the level and severity. If it's just a little bit of a shift here and there, that's a common subluxation. And actually having slightly looser joints is not a bad thing. Make sure that you keep your muscles strong to provide stability. So when you need the shoulder to be stable, the muscles will be there to help you. If you have a true dislocation where the ball comes out of socket, if you've had a fall or even without a fall, if it happens in your sleep, even worse, that's a sign of an unstable shoulder. You need to go to the emergency room to put it in, even more of a sign that your shoulder is not gonna be stable and is, may need some help to be able to stay in place. I'm also gonna be able to evaluate and ask you questions about maybe the direction that it came in and all those play into how we might consider treatment. One of the options if we've gone through physical therapy and exhausted other treatment is surgery. And this is an example of how we do this in a really minimally invasive way, outpatient, just small holes through what's called arthroscopy. We're looking in the shoulder joint and with these very two to three millimeter size implants, we're able to restore that important bumper, that edge of the pool table that was torn and hanging off to the side, all of a sudden in one surgery, less than an hour, gets brought back into place. It's very stable and patients have a much quicker recovery. We can get people back into sport same season if we can do this at the right interval and the right time and they're good about doing their exercises. So this works extremely well and has changed tremendously our approach to shoulder instability. It's a great way to save the shoulder and prevent cartilage from occurring. How about rotator cuff injury? This is a very common problem that I see patients experiencing, pain in the shoulder. Usually it radiates down because the deltoid, the big muscle you see on that diagram on the right, that big muscle on the outside has to do a lot more work. That gets inflamed and people feel pain down here, even though the shoulder joint higher up has the injury. It can be worse with reaching overhead. If you're playing tennis or you know throwing with the follow through, it can be painful taking off clothes, even sleeping at night. That's when the ball starts to ride up and pinch against that tear and the bone spurs. 
So what do we do in this situation? Does everyone need surgery? Definitely not. This is something where we individually tailor the treatment and make sure that depending upon what your demands are, we focus the right treatment for the right patient every time. And that means if you're older, I had a 78 year old gentleman in my office today who was actually doing really well. He fell off his bike, you know, trying to stay active, but he had a tear, it was full thickness, but I could tell he had the effort, the motivation, and he was able to lift his arm reasonably well. He didn't have a lot of pain. He's someone we're gonna work on a conservative treatment for. Now, also at a 60 year old patient or in a 40 year old as well, with full thickness rotator cuff tears from workouts in my clinic today. Those people who had sudden onset of pain, a full thickness tear, they're the ones who will not benefit from non-operative treatment. We want to consider, if you can see in that image on the bottom right of your screen, that tendon has been ripped off a bone. The white portion on top is the rotator cuff tendon, and that tan color underneath is the bone that should be covered by that white tendon. So it's been ripped away. There's no force in nature that makes that tendon suddenly leap back into that space. And all the joint fluid keeps going in and out of there, so it's not gonna grow back. Those patients, unfortunately, if we leave them alone in their young age and you know, high activity levels, those tears get larger and bigger over time, and eventually the joint starts to become unstable. They develop arthritis, and that's what we want to avoid. So those people will go through a minimally invasive arthroscopic repair. That's how we save the shoulder in patients with those injuries. What that involves, thankfully, has changed a lot. It is now the state of the art with what's called a double row repair technique. Now I have patients after surgery and I'm seeing them back in recovery and they say, doc, I only have these three small holes. How'd you do all that inside my shoulder? I said, well, it was like building a ship in a bottle. It's magic. Well, now you're seeing the magic here in this video. It's just three small holes. We're able to put in two different rows of anchors carefully pass the sutures and my assistants help me shuttle these sutures back and forth in a way to weave those sutures like a net. And then we compress that entire tendon back down across the almost two centimeters, you know, three quarters of an inch where it would attach and get all of it pushed back onto bone. It allows for much more reliable healing rates, stronger result at the end of it all. So patients have better strength at the end of the day and they have much better recovery and return to sport. Now, what happens if, despite those best efforts, the tendon may be shredded, it may be really badly injured, or a patient may come to us having had a tear for a long period of time. The tissue is going to be weaker and maybe harder to heal. So one of the things we've now got an opportunity to use is a really interesting rotator cuff repair augment device. This, amazingly enough, is actually made out of cow tendon, of all things. So laying that on top, you know, it doesn't make you, you know, have any other cow characteristics with it other than a really strong tendon layer that we can put on top of a, a standard repair or even partial tears. The tendon is immediately thickened and goes on to a faster healing and more reliable and stronger recovery. So it's really revolutionized and changed tremendously options for patients getting better, more reproducible and, and more reliable ways to save their shoulders in the future. Now, what about patients who have severe arthritis? This is not where the issue is a muscle or tendon problem, but rather that smooth gliding cartilage. We, as of yet, don't have a great replacement for cartilage, particularly when the whole surface is gone and we can't do any grafting techniques or other things. If you have unbearable pain, just can't live with it anymore, and you've failed all conservative treatment, injections, therapy, other things, Thankfully, the outcomes of shoulder replacement are much better. We have better longevity, the implants last longer, and we have the ability to use CT scan or CAT scan, which is very precise x-rays, to do 3D simulation, computer simulation of your shoulder replacement, and then carry out that plan in the operating room. So the end result is fantastic. It's almost like a custom designed implant for you to rebuild your shoulder joint if it really gets to that extreme. We're able to get the exact millimeter in terms of the amount of bone and tendon that's missing and rebuild and restore that back to a almost as good as new uh, shoulder for you, you know, with a, a little bit of metal and plastic in your joint. And this can now be done as an outpatient, home the same day, and patients have really 
uh, benefited tremendously from this option as a way to get out of that unbearable pain that can come from shoulder arthritis. A lot of people have learned about a newer type of operation called reverse replacement. Now this is in patients who, in whom we have arthritis, but we also are missing not only the cartilage, but those important tendons that provide stability around the shoulder. If that's the case, and that ball is shifting up and down, if we did a regular replacement, putting in a new ball and a new socket, that would still shift up and down and cause pain just from it being unstable. So the reverse replacement actually puts in a ball into where the socket is and a socket down where the ball was, as you see in that image on the right. And then there's no shifting and the socket is able to rotate around the ball. That allows for the patient to get substantial pain relief, stability, and if it's the right procedure for that patient, gives them a much better chance of lifting and raising the arm and having much better functional recovery overall. So this is another place where we are doing the CT scans and 3D simulation and computer planning to get really, really great results for patients uh, you know, in a very predictable manner. Now, shifting gears, what about the knee? Very commonly injured, very commonly painful joint in the body. Again, acute injury, if I see it come in and you've got a sudden problem, could be a fracture that we need to worry about, could be a dislocation. I saw a 13-year-old uh, middle school football player today, excited to get back to school, excited to get back into sport. And unfortunately, when he was in, in uh, just even in scrimmage, a couple of pivots and twisting with his knee, contact to the front of his knee caused that kneecap to most likely dislocate come in and out of socket. Very painful for the young man, but thankfully there's options and ways where we're gonna help him. Other things to consider. If you're running, you feel a sudden onset of pain, or you might have a pivot or twisting injury. Maybe you play soccer, you're a weekend warrior, and you plant and twist, you can end up with what's called an ACL tear. The knee might blow up like a big softball or big balloon. That's when all that blood supply from that ligament we showed in that earlier anatomy slide all that's going to cause bleeding in the knee and a big swollen knee. We worry about an ACL tear in that setting. How about a chronic injury? If this has just been going on over the months, you know, not something that happened suddenly. If you're doing a lot of, you know, bending and straightening of your knee, you might notice a little bit more creak and ache or popping as you're going up and down stairs. That's called chondromalacia. That's softening of the cartilage underneath the kneecap, that bone in the front of the knee. And as it glides back and forth, you're going to feel that crunching and popping over the front of your knee. We can also see that with osteoarthritis or wear and tear arthritis, even inflammatory arthritis, those who have either the skin changes, which is called psoriatic arthritis, or rheumatoid arthritis, where there's inflammation in the joint itself. Those can lead to some chronic joint conditions. You can also get pain just from things as simple as tendonitis or bursitis around the knee. And then we also obviously have to watch for any referred pain from the back or what I didn't mention in terms of the shoulder, the neck can be a very common cause of pain back in the shoulder blade. And if it's back pain, you can get common pain around the front or the inside of the knee. Other things that are important to consider with the knee are how the injury might have occurred. It's different if it's a direct blow to the knee, we worry about that fracture, or the twist pivot squat injury, we worry more about the meniscal or ACL tear or a cartilage injury. If it's traumatic, again, we have different things we consider, or atraumatic, where we think about a more of a degenerative process over time. And location matters, and that's what the information is on the side to the right. Location, 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 they always talk about in real estate. Well, it's true in orthopedics as well. It, depending upon where you point to your knee and the pain helps me understand more about where that cause might be really coming from. So if it's right in the front of your knee, and you're going up and down the stairs and the knee pain is right in the front, that's where we think about that cartilage injury underneath the kneecap or some wear and tear arthritis. A lot of people have heard about something called a cyst in the knee. That in the back of the knee is an area that fills up because you might have either a swollen knee or something inside the joint like a meniscal tear causing pain or injury and the body wants to oil that squeaky wheel so the fluid builds up and then it'll leak into the back of the knee. It's like an escape valve, not harmful, not a tumor. It's just part of your natural condition and what may be happening. But it does give us good clues about what may be going on. Other problems on the inner or outer side of the knee 
can either be related to arthritis if the problem is severe or possibly a meniscal or cartilage tear. So we discussed in uh, some other uh, portions of the talk, meniscal or ligament injuries are very common, particularly in terms of causes of popping or locking or catching. Those are called mechanical symptoms where your knee just doesn't feel stable. And that's something that we really focus on because the last thing you wanna do is let a little cartilage tear cause a fall. So we focus on understanding that in terms of the history on physical exam, we try and figure out where it's tender. If you're concerned whether or not it's something you need to be seen for, you could feel around your knee and see if there's any places that hurt, that are swollen. If you feel weakness in your knee, that could be a sign that the cartilage that you normally depend on is suddenly shifting or moving out of the way and you can no longer have a knee that you're confident in. That's something you should uh, seek help for. Instability, similarly, if you've got a ligament tear or even an unstable meniscal fragment, or stiffness where the knee is swollen and you just can't bend or straighten it. All those are signs of a possible meniscal or ligament injury. Now, this is a busy slide, but it's mostly to show you that there's lots of options out there in terms of how we can treat knee problems. And again, I focus a lot on avoiding surgery. That's what I would want for me and my family, and that's gonna be my initial advice to you. So we're gonna focus on icing, anti-inflammatory medications, over-the-counter is gonna be helpful. Therapy and strengthening is always key. The steroid injection that I mentioned earlier, I approach with some caution. Steroids given in large doses or over time can actually cause weakening in the cartilage. Instead, some patients may be good candidates for lubrication injections. You might have heard of rooster comb injections or other types. Well, there's newer advances. We've gotten past the rooster and the chicken and moved on to actual better oil changes in the knee that provide better lubrication, better gliding. And then I'm gonna to touch on in a couple slides here about the latest advances of stem cells and platelet therapy that have really changed the opportunities for healing in the knee. It sometimes is very helpful to think about a brace. So compression, if your knee is swollen and really achy, that itself leads to pain. So just getting an over-the-counter knee sleeve, that looks like an ACE wrap or a neoprene tube, slide that over your knee, it can provide immediate comfort, stability, and support, and may be the answer to your problems. In the office, we can prescribe specific unloader braces. If your pain is on one particular side of the knee or the other, these braces can help avoid weight bearing on that side and allow you to have stability and be able to walk more comfortably. And then certainly, if it hurts when you do something, don't do that. Modifying your activities is always beneficial. We're also gonna consider x-rays and possibly an MRI. If you're young and we think about soft tissue injuries or we have mechanical symptoms, the locking, catching, or giving way, we're gonna get an MRI. Surgery, my main goal is focusing on repair. So I'm gonna focus on trying to repair your meniscus or removing that torn fragment. That's called a meniscectomy. ACL reconstruction has really come a long way. We're gonna to touch on that in just a minute. Cartilage grafting, if you've got a very isolated defect, and the rest of the knee is healthy. There's a variety of options out there that we can discuss. And then if the cartilage is really more severely worn, even in young active, active patients, partial and even total knee replacement are now options. So stem cells, this is really an amazing cell in your body. Thankfully, they're all over, they're found throughout your body. And for the most part, they're beneficial in producing those red blood cells we need every few days. Unfortunately, as we get older, that our stem cell population starts to decline. And so what we do have options for are using other cells in the body, your platelet cells, very functional, very active, and can produce very good results. And both of these cell populations have been found to promote, promote natural healing. And that is key. That's the miracle grow we wanna be able to put into an area of injury. And all these injections, whether stem cell or platelet-rich plasma injection, in my practice, we do under ultrasound guidance. So we get those specific miracle grow cells into the right place every time. And the results have been fantastic if given in the right situation in the right circumstances. There's also very little side effect because it's your own cells. And so we don't have to worry about your body rejecting it or getting you know, problems associated with it. In initial animal studies, veterinary medicine has a lot of data on this and in human applications, particularly treating tendon, in, tendon injuries, and then early cartilage injuries, before the joint is really badly deformed, that's when these types of treatments can be very beneficial. 
stem cells have actually been shown to be able to grow into new cartilage, not only in the Petri dish in the lab, but even in actual human application. Not every, it doesn't work in every patient and not everyone's stem cells are up to task, but we've seen some really good results. The other interesting finding is without having to do the, the somewhat you know, uh, involved harvest of stem cells where we take it out of your bone marrow, just a simple blood draw, like you would go to the lab and get your blood drawn, we can actually isolate platelets. Those cells that'll heal a cut in your skin, those platelet cells bring in not only the ability to heal that area, but they also bring in growth factors. When we combine injections of those PRP or platelet-rich plasma cells and those lubrication or oil change injections we talked about, we've seen tremendous healing and actually improvements on follow-up MRI and actual arthroscopy studies looking at the knee joint afterwards. So, so two really great options to try and turn the clock back. Maybe not back to when you were a teenager, if you're in your later years, but at least get better pain, uh, better pain relief, better healing, and better function. Now, what happens if you've torn a ligament and it's just disrupted? This is an example of our uh, new and improved techniques in terms of ACL reconstruction. Without having to do big open procedures through these small uh, incisions, we're able to do a what's called a tightrope technique and an internal brace. And that internal brace, those dark blue sutures you see in there are really critical to be able to provide a scaffold or a structure for that ACL or anterior cruciate ligament to grow into. And it keeps the knee stable right away and has led to much better recovery, faster return to sport and better outcomes for patients. And this has been in just the last couple of years has really taken off as a much more reliable way of doing ACL reconstruction. And I've seen a really, really uh, nice response to that in my practice. Now, how about if the cartilage wears out? If we've tried stem cells, if you've tried unloader braces, if you just have that wear and tear on the knee and you know, that smooth gliding surface like you see on the left portion of this slide is just worn out. Sometimes we may just need to think about going from conservative treatment to a more, you know, a more involved treatment and even a possible joint replacement. Thankfully, op options for patients have come a long way. We were able to really reproduce normal anatomy for patients and improve the durability with advances in the technology. Recovery is faster. We do so many of these as outpatients. Uh, now, patients go home the same day with either a partial knee replacement if you have just an isolated area of injury or even a full knee replacement. And it's really revolutionized orthopedic care, particularly as people are looking to not stay in a hospital and be able to get home to their loved ones sooner. And robotic knees is something that I should mention because it's really a, a very interesting way to combine the best in technology with really good precise surgery for patients. And not everyone's a candidate, nor does everyone need this technology, but I just bring it up because it's out there and available and really has changed one of the ways in which we can do surgery in a more precise manner for patients. I did the very first outpatient robotic knee replacement in the state of Florida, right here in Jacksonville in our Southeast Orthopedic Specialist Program. That was five years ago. And we haven't looked back. And we've been getting great results for patients ever since. So what does that mean? Well, as you can see in the image on the right, we can consider partial knee replacements or full knee replacements. And it involves, like you see in the central image, these tracking devices that help us get a good view of the knee and help to connect with the device or the robot, which is what you're seeing on the left. And this is an example of how that process occurs. We do that CAT scan, that's kind of that advanced x-ray, which is basically just a bunch of slices that we take of your knee to do really a close look and do a 3D virtual model. Helps us to get a really good sense of all the ins and outs of your knees, where the problems might be, what things we need to anticipate and plan for in surgery. We then go to the computer, make sure that everything is perfectly placed and get a precise plan for you and your knee. And then we translate that to the operating room. We have to make sure that what we plan for actually is there in reality, because not every scan is necessarily 100% accurate. So we use this probe, which you're seeing on that image, to make sure that the model that we have in the computer matches your true knee. And we select a bunch of different points around the knee to make sure we've got a good sampling. 
we then take your knee through a range of motion because it's not just the bone structure, but also the ligaments. We wanna make sure the range of motion is perfect and that we can then get a good plan for you. We then go through the process of removing all the arthritis. That's that worn out bone at the end of your knee. We do that with the saw that is guided by the surgeon, but limited by the robot. So my hand can't go any place that's not green, but I decide when and where the saw goes, get the exact plan, and then be able to make sure we get that near placement in the exact place we want it to be to get the best outcome for you and get the best longevity. So that's it in a nutshell. I deliberately kept, kept this talk a little bit on the shorter side to make sure we save room and time for your questions. That may be something called either heterotopic ossification where extra bone can form around the knee and cause the knee to be able to become stiff or the actual, the soft tissues start to form bone. And there are some very good options and techniques there. It also can be stiff and cause a difference in length because of other bone formation throughout the body. It's a problem that definitely has a good solution, but requires being very thorough in the workup and is something that I'd be honored to help with uh, in the office. We've seen patients who are heavier and carry more weight, unfortunately have an increased risk of complications. So for knee replacement surgery, we ask that you be able to bring your weight down to a safer level and there's particular um, parameters that we would talk about that would allow you to have better blood sugar control, lower infection risk, and better predictable outcomes. With that, the overall recovery can be pretty quick. Patients go from, as I mentioned, some outpatient, home the same day, even in their 70s, walking out of the hospital after doing a little bit of physical therapy, go home, recover at home, go to outpatient physical therapy. By a few weeks, they're no longer using a walker, maybe crutches or a cane. By six weeks, most of them feel like they're through the worst of it. And then three months, they're going through all the, the strengthening and stretching, and getting all their range of motion back. So really, the techniques have improved tremendously and recoveries are much faster than before. So uh, what you're experiencing, this was a question about a 72 year old runner. Congratulations, fantastic and an inspiration that you're running at 72. But you may have some pain underneath your kneecaps. That could be related to some of that wear and tear we talked about. The thinning in the cartilage underneath the kneecap can cause a little bit of scraping, aching, and pain. And one of the questions you asked was about yoga. That's very important to provide flexibility and protect your knee. Other things though are to really make sure that you're getting a balance in your exercise routine. You may need to focus a bit more on strengthening specific muscles like I showed in one of those other knee exercise videos particularly what's called that inner portion of your quadriceps muscle in the very front of your thigh that could help that kneecap glide back more in the center of your knee and have less rubbing and grinding. It may also be a sign of some tight tissues around your knee, particularly what's called the IT band that runs on the side of your knee. And that's something you may wanna involve in a proper stretching program that may not be covered in your yoga routine. Definitely something we can help with and be honored to have, uh, be able to see you and offer advice. Well, honestly, most of the time I see frozen shoulder without any associated injury. It happens more commonly in women, more commonly in age range of 40 to 60. And the risk factors for it are patients who either have a bad neck and they're constantly guarding their shoulder and then a simple reaching or lifting might cause a twinge of inflammation. And then because they're not moving their arm much, the joint starts to get tighter or stiffer. The same thing can happen if you have diabetes or thyroid problems, that can lead to stiffness in the shoulder. Now, thankfully the treatment, really the vast majority of the time does not involve surgery. A very well-placed steroid injection, this is one of those few circumstances where steroids do benefit as an injected treatment, followed immediately by physical therapy can melt away the inflammation and then restore a range of motion without an operation. 
Great question. And I really wish, you know, even though the science is so good and the evidence is there, the vast majority of insurance plans, unfortunately, do not cover stem cell or PRP therapy. There are some plans that are a little bit more forward thinking and realizing that if we can actually prevent further damage in a joint, help patients avoid progression of disease, we can avoid those really painful and involved or uncomfortable surgeries down the road and thankfully save the insurance company some money. So I'm hopeful that in the future they might be covered, but as of yet, it has not been widely accepted by insurance plans. There is a reason to be somewhat concerned because that click could be the edge of the tendon catching under the shoulder blade. So I would, I'm, I'm thrilled that you are able to recover and you're able to be out of pain for the most part, but I would not do any kind of repetitive movement or exercise that brings on that clicking over and over. That's not a healthy feeling or healthy experience. So do uh, focus your exercises on activities that avoid the clicking, and then it shouldn't be a problem for you in the future. Unfortunately, if you fall and break something and you break the bones, unfortunately the cartilage in those joints also gets bruised. So even though it may not look right away like there was some damage to the joint over time, whether just a, a few months, but usually a few years later, we do see what's called post-traumatic arthritis. And that's where damage in the joint itself can occur because of the injury and the, the fractured bones that occurred years before. And just to refresh uh, the slide where we talked about the socket, that ring of tissue around the socket in the shoulder, the very top of it is called the superior labrum. And it can tear from front to back, that's a slap tear, and it can make the biceps tendon unstable. So the vast majority of time, if it does require repair, it's important when doing that surgery to make sure not to over tension that tissue. That's where that particular technique that I showed avoids any irritating knots and other things that could cause problems with the biceps, town, biceps tendon down the road. And if you avoid over tensioning and start therapy early enough, you can actually get really almost normal function. Sometimes though, in the process of tearing that labrum, there can be additional injury to the biceps itself, in which case, despite our best efforts in repairing the labrum, the biceps may have occasional inflammation or tendonitis. That's something to work through and discuss with your surgeon about options to be able to quiet that process as well. Well, I honestly would suggest saving your nickels. There's a lot of, you know, big machines and bulky machines out there that are, are good, but in the end, you can get a really good workout from some of the simple band exercises that I showed you. Body weight exercises are beneficial, and even just a walking routine. Uh, you know, my parents have been trying to stay very safe during all of this. They're very healthy, very active, and they walk four miles a day. But they do it by doing laps around their yard. And they don't have any expensive machines. They're just staying safe, staying active, and staying healthy. They're true role models and inspiration to me in every way. But that's one option that I would consider that's great for cardio, great for exercise, gets you outdoors, and is a very safe option. Well, two different options. Probably the, the most widely studied are stem cells taken from your own body, and those are from your bone marrow. That's where the stem cells come from in our bodies that help to restore those red blood cells. And those are done through numbing medication, plenty of it, and drawing out those bone marrow uh, components. We then take that to a centrifuge, spin it down, and isolate the stem cells that way. The other source for stem cells is from someone else. There's donor stem cells uh, that can be used that do provide a very good level and concentration of stem cells, but 
you've got to weigh the risks and benefits of someone else's stem cells and you know concerns over where they might have come from, how they were processed, and not every company provides the same level of care and safety. So it just adds one more factor to consider. So typically we try and use your own stem cells, but there are some newer options for using donor stem cells that I think are now safer than ever and maybe a good option to consider, but it's after discussion with your physician or surgeon. The answer is a flat out no. <laughs> after surgery, you'd be in a sling. It would be really uncomfortable and really difficult to go through life for a few weeks in two slings. So I wouldn't put anyone through that, that discomfort. The other is, how long does it take to recover? So looking, again, data-based, we bring that, the whole purpose of that rotator cuff surgery is bringing the tendon back onto bone, all right? The goal, though, is actually having it grow into bone. It takes about 12 weeks for that to happen. Now, with these newer techniques, with the augments and the patches that I'm using in my practice, I've seen faster, more reliable healing, but it's still being conservative. I only want to do surgery once, have it be over, done with, and really predictable and reliable healing. So I'm still going to ask that you stay in a sling somewhere between four to six weeks for a rotator cuff repair, maybe two weeks for a labral repair, and then go through the rehab protocol over that time frame. It's about 12 weeks of physical therapy during that healing after rotator cuff surgery and steady improvement afterwards. The exercises that were in that shoulder video are important to do before and after surgery to avoid injury, particularly to the other side, because you're going to rely a lot more on your other shoulder as you're recovering. And we've seen in following patients for up to 18 months after surgery, you can continue to build muscle strength after we reattach those tendons. So do yourself the favor. If you're gonna go through surgery, continue to do the exercises afterwards. The patients who have the best results, whether non-operative or operative, are those who really commit to an exercise program to stay safe, stay healthy, and avoid re-injury. This is a great question and a great example of why we no longer operate on a meniscus tear just because it's torn. So this person at the age of 45 had a meniscus tear, that torn cartilage cushion in their knee. Most likely they didn't have any symptoms of locking or catching or giving way where they might fall or the knee becomes unstable. As long as that's the case, physical therapy that this patient received was absolutely appropriate and the right thing to do. Now, 15 years later, they're working out, doing exercise with little to no pain. Chances are very good as long as they continue to do that blend of exercise, strength training, cardiovascular, and flexibility, and focusing largely on non-impact exercise, they're going to keep their knee safe, avoid surgery, and not need to see someone like me in the future.